All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all for joining us on this rainy Friday afternoon. My name is Liam Foskett, and I'm a summer intern here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. And on behalf of the staff here and the rest of the interns, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the second installment of our summer intern lecture series, Mainstream Media's Distortion and Misrepresentation of the Palestinian Issue. Tuesday, we began our three-part series with a talk by Omar Badar about the extent of media bias and what it takes to combat it. Uh, and today, we are extremely honored to welcome Ms. Noor Wazwaz for a Palestinian journalist's perspective on reporting on Palestine and an inside look at media bias. Uh, the final lecture in the series by Tarek Bakoni will take place next Friday and will focus specifically on reporting on Gaza and the influence of journalism in the region on policymaking. Um, but a little bit about our speaker today. Uh, Noor Wazwaz is a journalist at the uh, National Public Radio here in Washington, D.C. Uh, at NPR, she produces radio content for Morning Edition and occasionally directs the program. Her work on the program has covered everything from the 2016 election to the Istanbul airport bombing. In addition to NPR, her writing has appeared in the Huffington Post, Vice News, U.S. News and Report, Military Times, and CNN, among others. She holds an MS in journalism with a concentration in multimedia journalism and a national security specialization from the Medill School of Journalism at N Northwestern University. Her reporting has taken her from Guantanamo Bay to Istanbul to Jerusalem and the West Bank, and in 2015, she was selected as a recipient of the White House Correspondents Association Scholarship. Uh, a Chicago native, Nora is a Palestinian American and will talk about the challenges and learning experiences that she's faced as a journalist when it comes to reporting on topics pertaining to Palestine. Uh, additionally, Nora will also share some research she found about media bias when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, Nora will be interviewed today by uh, another of our summer interns, Donna Lawbad, who is a rising senior at Framingham State University, uh, where she is majoring in global studies. Um, their conversation will last about 20 to 40 minutes, after which we'll have a short Q&A session. And for our online audience, you guys can tweet your questions to at Palestine Center. Um, so please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Ms. Nora Woz. -Woz. All right. Um, so I guess just to start, cause, uh, so we can get a little feel about what you're about, could you uh, tell us what inspired you to become a journalist? Sure, thank you. I just want to start off by thanking you all for coming um, today. I know it was really hard to, for me to get here with all the rain, um, but it's really nice to see um, all you guys here. And I want to thank you know the interns that have set this up. Um, can we just please give them a quick round of applause? <laughs> it's very impressive what you guys are capable of doing. Um, so to answer your question, um, I grew up with, as a Palestinian, I grew up with a Palestinian father who was always watching Al Jazeera. Uh, I know some of one who is any Palestinians would know how that is like. Um, so when I would sit with him, I never understood why he was so passionate about the news and journalism and politics. Um, but the more that I sat with him, I became passionate about it as well. And I found that um, I was I was wanting to learn more about you know the history, my history, um, what was going on in the Middle East, foreign policy, international news, and that was something that always um, kept with me. So fast forward, I went into high school, jo joined the journalism club, and I knew that I wanted to become a journalist, but my dad was not exactly very supportive. He was actually um, discouraging in a way just because I was a Palestinian Muslim woman. He didn't think that I would get anywhere with the media um, because he felt that it was so biased towards um, Palestinians and Muslims, especially post 9-11. Um, so I decided to go the safe route and go into something in the medicine field. And <laughs> Um, I had my undergraduate degree is actually psychology pre-med, and um, during my last semester of school, I decided, hey, this is not what I want to do, and I was kind of just, it was a little, you know, it, was, it almost hit me like a panic attack. I didn't know what I wanted to do anymore. I knew that I, somehow I was always um, going back to journalism. I took journalism elective classes. I still jo joined the journalism club um, in, in college, and so that's when I decided, you know, I'm going to take a break from school before jumping into any program. And then um, after just reflecting and just 
seeing myself regret not going into journalism, I decided this is what I'm going to do. I applied for uh, the grad program, as you mentioned, um, at Medill, and it was honestly the best experience that I had there because I, it was such a learning experience for me. Um, I was able to travel to many different countries, um, cities, and report on topics that I was very passionate about, including Jerusalem, the West Bank, and never was passionate about Guantanamo Bay, but I got to go there too, which was an eye-opening experience for sure. Awesome, thank you. Um, so you graduated from journalism school and you worked as a student reporter during school, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you talk about how different it is reporting on a college campus uh, versus now at NPR and maybe also talk a little bit about how that relates to the Palestinian issue specifically? Sure. Um, so when I started my grad program at sh in Chicago, it was more of just learning the basics of journalism, the foundations, the ethics, the law of it, um, just so that I have the tools for me to become a journalist. So I was there for six months um, in Chicago, and then there was an option to do my capstone project in D.C., which I was reporting from the newsroom um, here in D.C., and we were partnered up with different news organizations, um, just like the ones that you listed, Military, Military Times, USA Today, Vice, etc. And that gave me the work experience that I needed to be prepared to go into a place like NPR, um, because I was covering the Senate, the Congress, I was I had all the credentials that needed. I was, um, you know, side by side with other CNN reporters, Reuters, and everything. So that really had me equipped to be a reporter and like write with um, and edit with editors. Um, the diff, I mean, obviously there is a difference being a journalist in the real world versus school. You know, you're as, as a student reporter, you're allowed so many mistakes, but in the at like a place like NPR or other news organizations, you are held accountable for so many things. Like fact checking is fact checking. Um, accuracy is accuracy. And that's why I chose a place like NPR, honestly, is because I see how much they are so focused on making sure the story is true. We won't um, tweet, write, say anything on the air unless we know 110% that it's actually factually correct. I um, mean, I have respect for that, you know? Um, and going to your question about the Palestinian issue, I mean, when I was at Northwestern University, the SJP Student Justice for Palestine were um, voting to divest um, BDS from uh, organizations that were profiting off from uh, Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And I wanted to cover that. And I ran actually into a problem because I had contacted people from like the Hillel group and people from the SJP group and, and the president of the SJP, she found that problematic that I wanted to do a story um, including her and a voice from Hilal. She refused to do the story. And looking back, it was a learning experience for me. I can understand why she did not want to be included in the same story. Um, but I feel that I wasn't able to do that story because of that. So like both narratives were not allowed to, or yeah. weren't able to go in there. Um, so I feel like now at NPR, I feel like there are more people that will be willing to get on the air and talk maybe because, you know, they know that their voice and their uh, message will be reaching millions of people. So um, looking at your past works, you've done several different pieces that might kind of fall into two categories, like you have breaking news, like you covered Brexit, and um, you also have these stories that are like narratives um, of personal everyday stories, like your piece about what it's like to be uh, an American Muslim woman. And I was wondering if you could talk about the interplay between each type of those journalism uh, styles and the, port the importance of each type. Sure. So a majority of my work right now at Morning Edition, um, daily news uh, morning show, is a lot of breaking news stories, daily news, um, a lot of Trump, a lot of administration, a lot of um, just everyday news. Um, so with that being said, it's very like three minutes experts tell us what's going on. Um, we try to get voices from on the ground whenever we can, but it's very, um, sometimes context is missing because of time constraints, um, which is, which can be problematic, I found. And then you have like pieces that I've written for like the Huffington Post, like op-eds and more opinionated pieces, which are also very crucial because I think those are the pieces that open up dialogue and we get to hear from a diverse group of people and um, whether you agree with them or not, right? I still will read something in the New York Times op-ed, which I think is absolutely crazy, or you know, whatever it is, but I think it's very important to be open-minded with, I don't have to agree with you, but I think your opinion is um, valuable, and I have respect for you to write something, um, and that goes with everything of freedom of speech, right? Um, and as a journalist, 
I don't have to agree with everything that you say, um, but I will respect and fight for your right to, to write whatever you want and say what you want. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think also that helps with like, the lack of humanization in the issue is uh, when you talk about personal stories and bring these narratives to life, it helps people to kind of relate to the uh, stories. Yeah, I mean, one issue that um, I wrote about in the Huffington Post was my experience in grad school. Um, I was doing a, um, we were, it was a, a group, a class assignment. We were doing um, live video shoots for a PBS affiliate. And long story short, he did not want me to be on there because of my hijab. He said that it was distracting. And yeah, <laughs> so are those glasses, you know, so are those earrings or whatever, you know, what's, what does that mean, distracting? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so when I heard that, I was livid, you know? Um, and I had, thankfully, Medill stood by my side. They said, we treat all our, you know, students equally. If she doesn't get to do it, we're cutting off our, our contract, basically. And they took a very strong position, um, which I'm very thankful for. So. Um, I wrote about that experience in the Huffington Post as an op-ed, and that attracted a lot of attention because we hear about Islamophobia, we hear about the numbers, we hear about the hate crimes, we hear about all that, but when you take a personal story and you're able to share that, it humanizes it, like you said. Um, and that's just one example. And like another example that I can say about humanization is um, Aleppo, when that happened, we were just hearing millions of people are dying, millions of people are uh, refugees, and they just become such a statistic and such a number that we forget that each person is like, an actual person, a story, they have goals, they have hopes, they have dreams. I um, mean, that gets lost with everyday reporting, everyday daily news. Um, and that's why me not being on the ground, I try to do my best using social media, getting those voices um, through Twitter, through social media, and like bringing them to our air. Um, so those are different ways of um, the importance of humanizing these voices. Um, earlier, just to go back, you mentioned that you did work in the West Bank and in Jerusalem. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I went there as a student with two of my colleagues, and what we were covering was, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Rasmi Aude. Um, she's the Palestinian activist in Chicago who was um, charged basically for lying on her citizen application form because she did not disclose that she was um, imprisoned in Israel. Um, she says that she was um, basically tortured to admit to um, a 1967 bombing that killed two Israelis. Um, so we were doing a, an in-depth investigation and research about that. We traveled to Jerusalem and the West Bank, talked with um, some relatives of hers, talked to people that were in prison with her. Um, why am I losing my train of thought? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so that was... Um, for me to go there, I've been there before, but for me to go there as a journalist, that was my first time. And it was the most eye-opening experience there because I'm not going there to eat knafe or just eat ice cream and hang out and like smoke hookah with my you know, cousins. Um, I'm, I was there, like I was staying at hotels and I never did that when I went there. I'd always stay with my family. But staying there and like interacting with the people that live there allowed me to hear their stories, their struggles. Um, especially like in Ramallah, I remember I was sitting at a hotel and the guy that works there, I stayed up till like three in the morning talking to him because he was just telling me about his frustrations. He had a master's degree in English, spoke English very well, spoke French, but he had no way to get a career because the Palestinian Authority had um, failed him and so did the Israeli Authority, you know, the occupation. So it's like for these people who are put in these positions, what is left for them to do? What are their options? So for me to go there as a journalist and hear these stories, that was something that really struck me because I knew there was an occupation. I knew that it was hard for Palestinians, but not when I hear the stories, it's so different. And I really encourage everyone, people who have not been there, to actually go there and spend time and hear pe these people's stories because it really um, changes you. And another aspect that I really gained from there is for the first time I walked through a checkpoint. Um, and I never knew what that was like. And it reminds me of the privilege that we have. We get stuck in like traffic for, what, 30 minutes and we're like, oh my God. And you know, we're in our cars. Um, but I was, it was a hot summer day, standing outside, waiting in line for whenever the Israeli soldier really wanted us to show the passport and let us walk through. And there was a long line. And I was like, oh my God, it's so hot. And I, I felt my privilege kicking in. And I was looking behind me and seeing all these Palestinians. And this is everyday life for them. Um, so definitely a lot of eye-opening experiences. I think I'm going a little long. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's perfect, yeah. Um, 
as a Palestinian journalist, do you find it hard sometimes given the dominant narrative in the media to get your voice out? I think, I think as a journalist, one thing that is crucial is for journalists not to focus on their voice. Um, I think it's really important to take ourselves out of the story, even if I am a Palestinian, even if I am Muslim, even if I am a woman, and all these things do affect me to some way. But I'm basically the person that's telling other people's stories. I'm not telling my story because that's not what sh journalists should do. You know, they should not insert themselves in stories. And when that starts to happen, I think that's really problematic. Um, so when I see issues like Islamophobia or the Palestinian, Israeli-Palestinian conflict or whatever issues are going on and happening, you look for those voices to voice those concerns. Like, I won't tell you how I feel about a certain issue, and I won't tell you how to feel. I will show you the stories. I will show you the facts. I will sh share people's stories with you, and you decide how to feel. Yeah, I think that's one thing I hear a lot is about journalists have this bias and they it usually, like, people say it shows when they're covering a story. Um, have, has that been, like, your experience or? I mean, everyone has bias, right? We all grew up with different experiences, our cultures, our religion, our gender, whatever it is. We all have unique experiences that are unique because we have lived them. And I think it is important to acknowledge those biases, you know? Um, and once you acknowledge them, as, well, I mean, as a journalist, you acknowledge your biases, and sometimes you may not notice them, but when you have editors and producers and you work at a newsroom, there's different lines of defense to be like, put you in check and be like, hey, this was kind of biased, or this was not, the wording that you used here was not, you know, very accurate or, or balanced, and then you'd have someone to check over your work. So that's why it's, and, and that's why it's important to have, like, diversity in newsrooms, really, because someone may think that they're saying something that's not very biased i guess you would say um or they're they're not seeing that they're missing a crucial uh, perspective but when you have a person who has di you know ha is a di comes from a diverse background they're able to flag that and be like hey you're missing a palestinian in this piece about israeli palestinian conflict you know and i have done that at npr honestly um i started there as an intern and um, I remember when they were they were saying like the third intifada. They were that's what they were calling it with all this increase of violence there, the stabbings and all that that was going on. Um, I remember we were calling them Arab Israelis, and I was like, hmm, why are we calling them Arab Israelis? And I w and I was like, I remember I was fighting with myself internally, just like, should I say something or should I not? Should I say something or should I not? And you know what? I was like, you know what? whatever, I'm an intern, I don't know what's the worst that can happen, you know? I'm gonna go, and I went and I talked to the deputy managing editor, and I let him know, I think it's problematic that we're calling them Arab-Israeli, unless that's how they specifically want to be identified. They are Palestinians. It's simple as that. I mean, why are we, like, if we're doing a story about Egypt, in Egypt, we're calling them Egyptians. We're not calling them Arabs. We're not calling them, um, if, you get it, you know? So, he had went and referred to the New York Times to see what they were reporting. And he was like, see, the New York Times is doing Arab Israelis. And I was like, well, that's part of the problem. We should not be just going through what other media organizations are reporting as well. We should have our own standards. So t to be honest, he, that didn't really do much. Fast forward a year and a half later, same thing. I saw in, a, in an introduction that a reporter wrote. He called them Arab Israelis. I went to the Middle East editor, and I was like, listen. And I felt like I had a little more authorities now that I got hired. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I was like, um, yeah, I'm curious to know why, you know, and it, it, something that I've learned myself is to go, and when you want to open up a discussion like this, is to go and do it in a productive way. Put your emotions aside, because once you're emotional and you're so passionate, then you, that's your bias, right? So, um, hi, <laughs> sorry. Um, so... I had went and I talked to him, and he, it was a very productive conversation, and he was very happy that I raised that. And I told him, the ba basically, the same people that live across or on the other side of the wall are Palestinians, same as, same as that. So they, he actually took those, I mean, it was a more in-depth conversation, of course, but he went and took those concerns to our senior, um, uh, what's his title? Some senior editor in our newsroom that basically um, makes these decisions, as well as the deputy managing editor, and guess what? Now we use Arab Palestinians or Palestinian Arabs. So a small, a small word change, but it makes a difference because 
That way you are not diminishing the narrative. And it's not a small win because it follows a pro-Palestinian um, narrative or an anti-Israeli narrative. It's a, it's a win because it's factually correct, right? And that is journalism. Journalism is about being factually correct and uh, making sure that you have the right context. Yeah, actually talking about that, um, in uh, 2014, NPR, they finished this study that was of like um, a span of 11 years of their reporting about um, it, pal the bias that might have been presented on the Palestinian-Israeli issue, and they found that there was no bias, but they found a lack of, um, they found a lack of like uh, Palestinian voices um, reporting for NPR, and they found that maybe some of their stories weren't um, complete with the facts. Um, I don't know what year you spoke up, but do you think that has changed since 2014? Or? Yeah, I definitely came after 2014, and I honestly did not know about that study until you flagged it for me. Yeah. So I was like, oh, let me go and read this. And I didn't read through the whole study because it was a very in-depth um, study. But I did look at it, and yes, um, I saw that there was no systematic bias. But um, from research that I've seen and I've read about and I've done, NPR isn't much different than... Or I guess you could say a lot of news organizations fall into this category of one of the problems is that there isn't um, context given. You know, there isn't historical or political context um, given when telling the stories. And I'll I'll go and talk about it a little bit more in depth of what research I've seen. Um, but that's you know just to give you an idea that that's what a lot of the mainstream um, media outlets are missing is just giving context, which I will talk more in depth yeah, about, yeah. but just to give you a short answer. Yeah, so um, how do you, what do you think of like the coverage in the media of the Gaza crisis, whether by NPR or by media in the U.S. in general? Um, honestly, I haven't really like looked into it thoroughly to like actually give a substantial answer, but what I will say is um, <laughs> When you hear about Gaza, you think Hamas, you think Israel, you think rockets, you think back and forth, you know, war and stuff, and then you lose the humanization of the story, right? Because in Gaza, there are people who are living there, and I feel like we can do, and NPR included, we could do a better job of hearing voices from there. I would love to hear more voices in there, from there, and honestly, I, I don't know why we haven't. Um, I know when I started as an intern there, one of the stories that I had uh, pitched and produced was um, in Gaza, they had just uh, PCRF, Palestinian Children Relief Fund. Um, they had just uh, started building a, the first cancer center there in Gaza. And that's something that I wanted to, um, you know, bring attention to because the reason that they needed a cancer center there was because Israel was not allowing um, these kids to go to Israel to get treated. And if they were letting them go, it would take, it was such a long process. It was a very tiresome process for someone who is sick. And a lot of the times the mother or the parents could not go with them. They would have to have the grandma go, who is also, who is elderly. So it's just a very, it's, it's hardship on hardship on hardship just to go get treated for something. So that was something that I wanted to raise awareness. Um, but I do agree that we could definitely do more. Um. The U.S. and Israel have like a long-standing allyship. Um, so you don't say. <laughs> Surprise. Um, the you know we send them billions in military aid. What kind of influence or message do you think that sends to journalists and reporters in the U.S.? Hmm. <laughs> um, well, what I can tell you is that that is what's missing from context. Right? Is that role that the U.S. has when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, which I will also talk about in the research that I, I found. But I think that when we are missing this context, we aren't able to um, accurately tell the full story because the reason that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been prolonged is because of the like from 1967, the U.S. has been particularly involved, $100 billion to date, um, roughly, in, um, in aid and including advanced weaponry. So it's not really assisting or helping the current situation. Um, but I will say that because given the, I think I mentioned this earlier, time constraints of um, like TV news or radio news, there's only so much context that you can um, have, right, in, like, you know, in, in a story. Um, but that is not to say that I think that Accurate and fair reporting is still um, very necessary, but that really, it goes back to the American public, right? To if you take the story and you consume the story, go.
go find supplemental information to to read about that story. You know, go read other articles or other videos or other resources um, that will further the story and give you more context. Yeah, that kind of goes into like maybe the like it helps to perpetuate like the spread of like fake news, like that fake news epidemic, um, giving half stories and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so fake news is very real and it's very dangerous. I mean, you, if you remember the story that happened in December with the man from North Carolina who drove up to D.C. because he heard this story about, I don't even remember exactly what it was, but the pizza place, yeah, that was um, trafficking, I think, young girls that was run by Hillary Clinton or something. I mean, don't quote me, but it was just something so bizarre. And that was because he saw a fake news story. He went up with a gun and a rifle and he decided to shoot up the place. Luckily, no one was, I think, injured or like died. But that just shows the danger of fake news and the things that we um, share on social media. And I think in a time where social media, that's where a lot, I mean, that's where I get my news from, you know, like Twitter, and then you see the news articles and stuff. So I think that's, it, it goes back to people just making sure that you, the sources are credible. I see people on my Facebook posting really, really bizarre things. And I'm like, really? Like, how do you not know that's not fake, you know? But really, people don't know. And I think um, there's, you should definitely, there's a, like a checklist of things that you should do is make sure that the source is credible. You know, who are they? Who is being, who is being um, quoted? Is it a real person or is it someone said, you know? So just uh, these little things to pay attention for to make sure that you are consuming real news. Yeah, actually, I think on Facebook now there's a feature where you can report yeah. like an, a post for being like fake news or like, um, uh, yeah, I think it's you just like click on the settings and it deletes that person's post. But I don't know if it deletes people who shared it. But hmm. that's yeah, a thing. There, there's a s yeah, definitely social media has been having to um, step up. And, but there's only so many algorithms that they can create. And then there's so many other algorithm algorithms that um, people who are creating fake news. So it's like... It's, it'll still somehow kind of exist because there's only so much that you can compete with. And that's why you still have to just be, re be really careful. Okay, so you've been talking about this research. Oh. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> it's let not you, that exciting. I'm going to let you present that. So right now we're just going to bring the, um, it'll take a couple minutes to get the PowerPoint set up. But um, stay tuned. <laughs> take your time. Okay, perfect. Is this working? Yes. Um, no, I think I have these. Thank you. So, um, as I was saying, I've done a little bit of reading and research about the way mainstream media has been reporting on the Israeli-Palestinian um, conflict, and I'm just going to share with you some observations and research that I have found. So, first of all, why is it important to have context, right? So, as we, some of you may know, I think a lot of people know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is one of the most familiar in the, um, to Americans and the longest um, one of the longest uh, conflicts that are out there, right? And as we have mentioned before, U.S. policy, um, the major role, especially after 1967, has changed the way the conflict has been ever since in, in, other, in, in very many ways, including the American aid to Israel, um, more than 100 billion, roughly. Um, U.S. has engaged militarily and politically in the Arab world and mo other Muslim worlds. Um, it's important that the Americans' uh, media, or trust the media to get the news, and not only just get news, but get news that is factually correct, and not only factually correct, but has important context of historical and political aspects of what is going on in the region. Um, so just a couple of things that I have seen um, with the patterns. So one thing is that 
a lot of the reports, they focus on the empirical and to the near of exclusion. So what does that mean? That means that a lot of the news that I saw, um, the news organizations were focusing on start and stop diplomacy. Basically, Trump is going to go meet with Pre uh, not, uh, Pr Prime Minister Netanyahu. Trump is going to go meet with Abbas. Um, so a lot of just like what is going to happen and a lot of talking heads just assuming what's going to be said, what is going to happen next, are they going to reach a peace process, and we get in-depth coverage about that, but we don't have the context of why these people are meeting and what led them to get there. And then a, a lot of coverage also with the cycles of the Israeli-Palestinian violence. So we'll see a lot of coverage, 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 coverage about that, but a lot of context is missing. So you'll hear Palestinians are stabbing Israelis, but we don't have the um, background or the context of there's an occupation going on, there's um, settlements, an increase of settlements, there's annexation of land. So two, um, as I was saying, two of the most um, repetitive themes that I've seen that are missing is one, the impact the U.S. policy had, has had on this conflict for many years. Um, again, repeating $100 billion in aid, including um, advanced weaponry, and the political and um, political backing of the, U, uh, the U.S. with the U.N., you know. Until recently, we saw that the, UN, uh, the U.S. had vetoed, um, or refused to veto, the settlement um, in December. So that, and that was a big surprise for the U.S. because they were so used to getting political backing by the U.S. Um, in, during the U.N. And we, it's important to mention that, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, it's important to mention that the aid to the Palestinians since 1994. So as we see, $1.8 billion plus $3 billion for Palestinian refugees, that's including in West Bank, the uh, Gaza, Gaza Strip, Lebanon, Syria, and Lebanon. Um, so, as you could see, there is disproportionate amount of aid given either to, Isra uh, to Israelis and to Palestinians. You cannot compare. Um, and that is, again, missing in reporting because we have to, um, we kind of don't really share, a, or mainstream media does not really share the amount of influence the U.S. has had on this conflict. Um, another important factor is just how the U.S. Had, in 1992 had withdrew um, the recognition of Palestinians' right of return, which did not help with the peace process, of course, because Palestinians are so adamant and it's under international law that the Palestinians, like every refugee, deserve to go back to their, um, to their home. And I think this one's most obvious is that the U.S. Is, um, favors Israeli security over the Palestinians, and that's something that... Um, again, is missing out of context in the news. And part two of what is missing um, in the reporting is that the re media re uh, rarely acknowledges or explains international law. So under international law, um, settlements are illegal. Under international law, the occupation... Um, uh, Sorry, the occupation in and around Jerusalem is also illegal, and that I feel like a lot of the mainstream media um, is a little bit hesitant to call it what it is, and, and it's illegal under international law, so that's also a context and historical perspective that is also missing. Another aspect that I also mentioned, but just to reiterate the importance of it, is that um, under international law, Palestinians have a right to return to their homeland, um, and that you know, when Palestinians are up and they're saying that they want to go back to their country, a lot of people are like, well, you left, you, we won the war, something like that. And I, that's when international law should be out there and say, yeah, maybe they left or maybe they, um, if they were displaced or they fled the war. Um, but under international law, they have the right to go back to their, uh, to their homes. And that's something that I saw when I went back to uh, West Bank in Jerusalem. Um, Rasmi Aude was from Lifta, which is a village from the outskirts of uh, Jerusalem. And that it was one of the first villages that was displaced and people f uh, fled in 1947-48, before the Nakba or the catastrophe. Um, and when I went there and I saw the houses, you, saw, you see that the... I wish I actually brought pictures of this, but it's actually really remarkable. Um, the houses, the roofs were bombed so that they wouldn't come back. 
um, even after the war. And a lot of people thought, you know, 10 years, 15 years, we will come back. But unfortunately, as we can see, that that was not the reality of that they were living in. And as you probably know, the his, like the historical symbolism of um, Palestinians leaving with their keys. And I've, I've seen a lot of that there too, which was very symbolic in the sense of Palestinians want to return back to their home countries. And that is also missing from, that, from the context of the mainstream reporting. So what can be done? I think one of the things that I saw that would be helpful is to reframe the frame. What does that mean? It means to acknowledge and analyze the impact of US policy has had on this conflict. Um, do not shy away from the, the, whether it's the military aid or the, um, the, the UN um, role of the US. And um, I found myself guilty of this too when I first started as a journalist is that we rely on, you know, an Israeli said this, a Palestinian said this, and call that uh, factually not biased and just uh, fair and balanced. But when we just say an Israeli said this and a Palestinian said this, it is so superficial. And we don't really get anything out of that, really, right? Um, so a, a better way to go about that is to broaden the parameters, expand the pool of sources, and sometimes, you know, people try to shy, um, like avoid talking to activists. And sure, maybe they won't make it into the story, but you should still listen to what they say because sometimes they might raise important issues or important points that we are not, like as a journalist, that I'm not being aware of. They're not just angry and they don't just have... Um, Maybe they are angry, but they don't just have this one um, motive, and sometimes you could actually gain from them. Um, another thing is that we, as journalists, should reconsider the role that the audience has. So sometimes we see that if a story is either too pro-Palestinian or too pro-Israeli, or we only have Palestinian voice and we, all have, we only have Israeli voices, we can get worried that we're going to you know, be called biased or be attacked. Um, we should stop focusing or focus less on that, but actually focus on the criticism that ha actually has journalistic merit um, and learn from that. And that doesn't mean we should ignore our listeners and our audiences, but it's to actually listen to more of our values and our core principles and believe in believe that we are reporting something because we believe that it is uh, that it provides context, that it provides accuracy, that it provides balance, rather than what how is this audience going to perceive this? Because if we only think about what the audience is going to say, then, you know, that is ultimately the definition of being biased, right? How, if I'm only worried about what you're going to say, I cannot report some things because I'm afraid that a pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian group is going to come and start attacking me on Twitter or something. Um, the fourth thing I would say is uh, rethink the concept of journalistic objectivity. So obviously focus on uh, fairness, accuracy, and contextual depth. Um, and I think that we should take a more critical approach with uh, telling the news. Again, not just focusing on the day-to-day -day events, because while we might not hear that a Palestinian stabbed an Israeli or an Israeli shot a, um, a Palestinian child or whatever, day-to-day -day there is still stuff going on, and we should not only turn attention to this particular region just when there's war or catastrophe. Like Gaza, we would go months hearing about the war, about the rockets going back and forth, and, all, and uh, Palestinians being used as human shields by Hamas. And then after the war is done, I can't even remember the last time I heard a story about Gaza in the mainstream media, right? When was the last time that we saw it breaking news on CNN? There's still a lot going on there, you know, uh, facing electricity issues, uh, poverty, um, hunger issues, and, and so on, you know. Um, and that is missing because we don't, follow up, or I don't want to say we don't care, but it's not as sexy or as appealing um, than when something actually is happening, like a war. And last but not least, you guys, the American news consuming public, you guys have a role to play. When you see something that's factually incorrect and truly factually incorrect, that's your responsibility to write to these news organizations, tweet at them, and not tweet at them angrily, like, you're biased, and like, you know, a lot of like trolls, basically, but to do it more in a more productive way so you are able to have constructive um, feedback and conversation. Because, for example, one, one um, recent issue or recent event that I remember is when Ayman Muhayyaldin, um, uh, what's he on? MSNBC correspondent, yeah. When he was pulled out of Gaza to cover it, 
everyone stormed Twitter saying that he should come back. And you know what? That put a lot of pressure on MSNBC, and he was ultimately brought back. So yes, the American public does have a role in um, what the news or has a role to basically fact check as well as um, fact check the news that you get. And also, I would say is not to rely only on one news source. Um, there are multiple news sources that we should turn to. And like I was saying uh, earlier, is to make sure that you are supplementing the reading or the, uh, the TV news or the radio that you're hearing with other sources as well, so that you have multiple dimensions and multiple uh, viewpoints that you can have um, when you're looking at a for example, like a breaking news story with an Israeli Palestinian, so that you are already equipped to know what is actually going on in the region. And it's not just, for you, it's not just, oh, this is a uh, Palestinian stabbed an Israeli, but you have more context and more background because you did your homework, too. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. And then we'll sit back. Sit back. Um, I liked what you said about the public having a role because I think that part of the reason why the media is biased is because we have a government that shows that bias and they, they have this narrative that they want to show and I feel like the media kind of, um, they, they reflect what our government reflect, is like putting out there and I think that um, if the people that are consuming that media speak up and say something that that could change that, yeah. But um, I was actually wondering if you guys, if you have any um, advice for Palestinians that are trying to become journalists or anyone who has a voice. And um, I think I would give this advice to more of like minority groups or people of color specifically is to go into this field because your voice is very crucial and needed. Um, I work at a newsroom that has a lot of white people, which is great, but we do need um, more diversity because. Um, Voices like mine are the ones that are raising issues that you know your everyday white person is not seeing. And not to say that white people don't have anything to bring, like I'm not trying to offend anyone here, <laughs> but it is just, it's crucial to acknowledge that diversity isn't just so that we have bias in our story, but it's to have a more critical approach and show diversity in our sources, diversity in our storytelling. and. Um, so that's one thing I would tell them is I would encourage them to go because I know I was at one point discouraged to go into this field. But we need, if we want to take control of our narrative, we need to go into places, uh, into fields like uh, the arts fields, uh, music, books, publishing, uh, authors, movies, journalism. Um, we, if, if we're sick of and tired of white people telling us, hey, um, or just constructing our narratives, then we have to take the approach and take the uh, steps forward to, uh, to go into this field. And another thing I would say is, if you're going into something like a field of journalism, it's not as glamorous as some people may get out to be, you know? Um, it takes a lot of work. For example, I'm working the overnight shift right now. Um, I got off work at 8 in the morning this morning, and I got 30 minutes of sleep, and now I'm here. So. <laughs> So Thanks. it's not glamorous at all. Um, you put in a lot of work, and if you're doing it to get famous or to get, gain popularity, then you're in the wrong field. Then you should go into something like, I don't know, acting or music or whatever. And you should realize that you are not the story. The people around you are the story, and you are not. And one thing that I would like to also distinguish is that you're not giving voice to anyone. Everyone has a voice. You're just giving them platforms so their voice can be heard because some people's voices are silenced because they are oppressed, because they don't have that mic, and we are giving them that mic to, say, to, um, to, to have their voices be heard. And I think that's very important because I'm not a fan of that whole quote is I want to give, you know, I see a lot of people on their bios have, I want to give the voice to the voiceless. And it's like, no, no one is voiceless. Um, and another thing that I would say is speak up. You know, when you're in a newsroom and you are the only one that looks different, um, and you have a critical perspective, it could be intimidating, but it could be very rewarding, and that is your job. The public trusts you to be that person to share your diverse opinion and um, pitch those stories that no one wants to pitch. Um, write that story that no one's going to write because you have something different to offer. And I think, lastly, I would say, um, do I have anything on that? I don't know. Um, Lastly, I would say is to really read and educate yourselves um, because you have to 
not only keep up with the daily breaking news, but you have to make sure that you are equipped with telling the right story because you have the context and you have the, again, I, I, will, I keep going to context because that is what's so crucial in, in, in telling these news. It's not just the everyday news, it's the context and you have to be equipped with the historical and the political um, underpinnings that are in these stories. So before we take questions from the audience, um, do you have any upcoming projects you're working on that we should keep an eye out? Um, so currently I'm producing the Up First podcast at NPR, which you all should subscribe and download. Um, so that's a big thing that I'm working on. And I'm actually working on like a passion project um, that I, I'm just very interested in my culture and who I am and just like in the Arab world. And one thing that I've noticed is that when we talk about the Middle East or the Muslim countries or the, the Arab world in general, we are always just thinking about war and destruction and um, oppression or whatever. It's very negative things. And there's actually a lot of rich gems that I'm learning about. And um, I know it's very broad, but you guys will have to stay tuned. <laughs> I don't want anyone taking my idea. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just basically working on a project that l allows me to uh, look into my culture, not just Palestinian culture, but just like my, the Arab culture and Arab world, and look at the co different contributions and the different uh, gems that are present in our, in our history, really. So, yeah. Keep. No, that's really cool. I can't wait for that. Um, so now we can start taking questions. If you guys want to raise your hands and uh, someone with a mic will come around. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. I'd like uh, clarification on uh, three things that uh, you said. Uh, and I think at one point I wasn't listening carefully enough, but you mentioned the uh, incident where uh, someone or some organization said your hijab would be distracting. What was that organization? Um, so it was a PBS affiliate. Um, he was a he was a freelancer for PBS, so I don't want to say he was PBS. Just to be clear, it was a freelancer that worked for PBS. Um, so he was basically he he had a show that would run on PBS, um, and he was basically the director and the producer of that show. And he ultimately had control over his show, but he just didn't want me to be on there because you know, like that you said, was what he said. And this was he said that, yeah. this was a panel. No, it was um, basically me doing a live shot. Okay. on camera, um, okay. just basically it was me on camera uh, going through what's going on in the news, just like you see on TV kind of, um, just like today's news is, you know, just giving a rundown on TV. Um, and he didn't, but eventually I did actually do it, but we don't know if it was ever aired because I had told him, and I actually wrote, an, I wrote the op-ed on the Huffington Post and I reached out for him for comment multiple times, like four times, and he ignored my email. And um, I still wrote it. I did him a favor and did not include his name because he could um, just be ignorant and didn't know. And I wasn't out to, my, me my, my message or my goal wasn't out to destroy this man, right? It was to share an important story that happened and just to make people aware that this is not acceptable. Okay. And the second one was your uh, objection to the use of Palestinian Israeli and your preference for Palestinian Arab. But... Israeli uh, Palestinians who are citizens of Ris of Israel have a whole set of different uh, uh, rights and so on that people in the territories don't. So I mean, uh, could you explain? I didn't understand why you would. Uh, so yeah, so instead definitely. of you could call them Palestinian Israelis, for example, would that be acceptable? Um, I wouldn't find that acceptable because I think. Well, let me tell you. So the way that we were wording it was they were calling them Arab Israelis. So one, we were diminishing Palestinians. That, that word did not exist. Um, two, we were assuming that they were equal, on equal footing with uh, is Jewish Israelis, right? When we know that there is systematic racism, they're not allowed to vote in some things, they are targeted, and so on. You know, there's a lot of studies and um, research that is more in-depth than I can tell you. So when we are calling them Arab Israelis, my argument is they are, how do they identify themselves? Some of the, some of the Palestinians, when you go there, they do say they, they consider themselves Ar Israelis. Fine. If that's what you want to be considered, fine. But I think it's one, it's important for journalists to ask how they would like to be identified. One. Two, um, you, by just assuming that they're Arab Israelis is just 
taking away the context that they are not actually treated equally, and two, that they are Palestinians because they just happen to be on the other side of the wall. Well, could you say Palestinians who are citizens of Israel? Yeah, so that's how we would, that's how we would, yeah, that's how we would say, um, I, 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 when I was talking to the editor, I said, you know, they're Palestinians, and he said, how about Arab Palestinians? I was like, fine, I don't care, you could add that, Arab, it's just more words, but you could add that, and it, so we basically call them Arab Palestinians uh, living in Israel, or Jerusalem. Okay, okay. and uh, the third would be, uh, you mentioned that in 1992, the U.S. withdrew its recognition of Palestinian refugees' right of return. Mm -hmm. How was that operationalized? Was it a White House statement? Did the State Department make a statement? How, you know, because I, I, I wasn't familiar with that. Um, I'm not sure exactly how the statement was made. Um, I'm pretty sure it was something that the State Department said, but I'm not 100% sure okay. how the statement was made. It just seems a... a but a, a under... International law, it, they have a yes, right to of return. of course, and the U.S., uh, you know, it seems to me that would be a major departure if what you're saying is accurate, which, you know, you may want to check it a little bit more. I agree with your uh, presentation, and um, uh, let me put this into a question. Uh, do you think that NPR um, satisfies the... Uh, things that you hold, uh, that you think are important for objective journalism. Uh, for example, do you think that NPR uh, names things uh, for what they are? For example, does NPR make it clear that occupation is occupation and that occupation is illegal, that settlements are illegal, that they provide this context or do they uh, often focus on, on incidents that are separate incidents that give you the impression that the Palestinians are very violent, but they don't uh, uh, describe the context in which all this violence happens. And also, the, the wording, I think, is so important in journalism, and so often I feel... Um, that that's an important thing to, to watch for uh, in any uh, radio program or, or newspaper. And when the Gaza, the attack on Gaza happened, I noticed that it was always portrayed on NPR like a, like a war between two, uh, two parties. And I think that is totally wrong and totally unjustified because Gaza obviously doesn't have an army, and when an army attacks uh, civilians, that's not a war. And uh, a lot of things like that, I think, that I have uh, observed. Uh, do you, how do, do you feel comfortable at NPR? And also the sources, are you comfortable with the sources they, they uh, tend to use over and over again? Um, I, uh, again, I think that uh, all these things, context and language, are extremely important. No, those are really good questions. It's a lot of questions, and I hope I can answer them all. Um, so in terms of if I'm satisfied with NPR's reporting, yes and no. I think there's always improvement to report, and I think NPR is aware of the biases that we have, if we have any. Um, and something that's important to know is that we are constantly having conversations you know it's not if we report this one way that's it and we're not ever changing just like I gave you this one, uh, one small minor example of changing the wording of Arab Palestinians to from uh, from Arab Israelis so conversations are constantly going and when there is something problematic that's why it's important for journalists to raise those issues and I am one of those people um, I will go to the editor and be like you know this was I think a little problematic because you know and I actually just met with a Middle East editor today and he was asking me how he thought the coverage was. And he, the reason that he asked me was because he knew that I care. And I think um, that's the first step of a journalist's position is to show that they care about their reporting. Um, so I would say that we are always having conversations about how we can improve our reporting. We're not perfect. Um, but we do try to be as, um, to give con as much context as possible. Another thing that I had mentioned earlier is time constraints. Um, when there are only incidents happening, uh, sure, we will be getting more coverage when it comes to uh, Palis Israeli-Palestinian conflict when there are, is an increase. You will see an increase in coverage when there's an increase of violence, right? Um, is context always there? Not so much. And I, 
I do make sure I raise those um, concerns as much as I can. Um, do you have, what was the other question? Oh, Hamas or Gaza and Israel war? Is that what you were asking about? No, it's about the language. I, I take a lot of issues with their language. The use of language or influences the uh, audience, obviously. And uh, I remember that uh, on NPR, they, when they reported on the uh, assault on Gaza, mm -hmm. it was reported like on a war, as if there were two parties that, uh, yeah. uh, at war. That's a very uh, important thing to me. Uh, that's a warning sign when, when that happens. And also, that, for example, how often do they report on uh, settler violence? When, when you read this uh, Middle East uh, Journal, or what it's called, you see a lot of reports on um, violence on, on Palestinian farmers mm -hmm. who uh, they go into the, to their olive trees. But you, how often do you hear about that on NPR? It's always Palestinian violence on, on Israelis. And I think it's very hard for, uh, for uh, people in the audience who don't have the chance to, to read other sources when you rely on NPR. I mean, you would get a, a pretty slanted uh, picture of the whole. I think you raise a lot of important concerns, and I would agree with you. There is stuff that is missing in um, our reporting, and sure, maybe we would in, we would um, focus more on, you know, Palestinian violence versus Israeli. And I think that's when the role of the public comes in. You see that as problematic. Please write to us and let us know what you think and what you think we should do. <laughs> no, honestly, I like if I um, write. So you do. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can talk after. <laughs> I don't know when to tell you. I mean, sometimes I will tell you, I will tell you, if you, just because you don't get an answer does not necessarily mean that they're not listening. Um, because we do reach, like my show, our, not my show, our show reaches 14 million listeners a week. So, of course, that means a lot of emails, a lot of different kinds of pe people. Everyone has something to say, right? And that's not necessarily we can always get back to them, but it is flagged. And I think that I would say that our editors do take it very seriously. Hi, Noor. Hi. Um, as a young Palestinian-American journalist, I know working in mainstream media can feel very lonely sometimes. Um, so I'm just wondering, where do you look for support when you're feeling that loneliness? Um, family, my friends. I mean, that's where else can I go? My faith. Um, just knowing, honestly, not even just being that one person that's different in the newsroom, but just especially like nowadays with the constant news of like the Trump administration and like the banning and all that it could get very overwhelming and I've made it a thing where I cannot look at the news over the week on the weekend honestly I don't even check it and I go into work on Monday and I'm like what was going on in the world because I did not check maybe that makes me a bad journalist but it has kind of like an emotional toll on you so I make sure that over the weekend I keep myself busy with other things <laughs> thank you for caring <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. Uh, first, a, a clarification, and then a, a question. Yeah. Uh, I think what uh, she was trying to say was, yes, you may be fact checking, and everything's totally accurate. Right. It's just not complete. Yes, and, and that's, that's one of the things that I was raising. Yeah, th but what that leads me into the next question, and I haven't been listening to NPR on this. I just know what I've been reading in the other media. Mm -hmm. How is NPR covering what's happening in Jerusalem now with the Al-Aqsa Mo Mosque? If you read the Washington Post, it's uh, they're trying to put up security, and the Palestinians are objecting to this. Now, why are they so crazy? Right. And, and, is and it, that's... And, um, yeah, and you know, and it, and it, the article will say, you know, they think that the Israelis are going to try to take over or not let them in, but it doesn't say why the Palestinians say this and what the history is and what happened in Hebron and all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what NPR does uh, is doing right now with that. Um, I will say that I think I was actually very. Imp I'm not just saying that I was actually very impressed with the way that we reported on this issue um, because. So let me tell you, when I went into work that w one day this week, I saw one of the questions that we had for our, one of the reporters in Jerusalem, um, Daniel Estrin, he's our Israeli correspondent. One of the editors wrote, what's the big deal? Uh, not, I mean, I don't want to, I'm just paraphrasing here, so this right. is not exactly, but she was basically like, 
what the question that she posed for the journalist was why is it such a big deal that there are metal detectors after their two Israeli officers were killed? Showing that obviously we should have metal detectors since two Israelis were met. And that's when I had, so this is, again, I go back to the point of we need diversity in the newsrooms because I pointed that out and I was like, this is a very problematic and leading question because we are assuming that these metal detectors are a given, that they should be there because that's the only way to solve the issue. When really we should say, so metal detectors are, are they want to put more security, they want to put metal detectors up. How, why are, what, what do Palestinians see as this? So give, so gives the journalist um, the platform to let us know what is going on on the ground and what Palestinians are saying instead of us assuming that, of course, that there should be metal detectors. Does that kind of make sense to you? Yeah, well, it's not just what the Palestinians are saying, it's what the Israelis are saying, you know, for the reason they want the de metal detectors. You know, it's for their security, well, bull. Right, and <laughs> that was something that was obviously Actually, uh, stated. I think I just heard that the, the Israelis have no business even doing that because it's Jordan who is supposed to be the uh, in charge of the, the mosque, the Israelis are not even allowed to, it's illegal for them to enter the mosque. Right. Or to put the and if you, I think if you look at the reporting, the, it, that was, I mean, it, when we were, that was context that was there. I can, I can say that for sure. Is that something that I saw? We have a question from the online audience. <laughs> so, um, are you doing this online? Thank you. And, yeah, it's uh, live stream. <laughs> Sorry. I think coming, uh, coming from an operational standpoint, um, at NPR, where you know you are national public radio, uh, public is in the name, um, but it oftentimes feels like you are fighting the public on you know fact reporting, right? So um, are you not reaching enough people, um, or they you're reaching different um, groups of people differently? What are the um, processes in within NPR uh, that you guys are uh, you know, putting into action in order to... To reach a wider audience? Not just to reach a wider audience, but also kind of defend, in a way, journalism in a, in a time when uh, journalists and, and what is to be known as fact, and you're talking about factual reporting, is under attack. Like by the administration, specifically? Well, administration also by, um, you know, various pockets of the public as well. I think the best way to end, defend... Both sides of the aisle our work and our integrity is to keep doing the work that we're doing. I mean, th we can't just sit up here and just protest, like say, we are journalists, we're real, we are not fake news. Um, we just keep doing what we keep doing and that's why we show up every day. It's just simple as that. That's the best way to defend our work. It's to show up to work and tell the stories that need to be told. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you, Nuke, for joining us. Thank you all so much. <laughs>